How many of you feel that autism has changed the way you view life, just totally changed your reality? You know, I, I, was, I was feeling that too, you know, when I was coming here, I was looking at my customs document, and it says, purpose of your visit. And you think it's a very simple question, and it's, okay, business? Well, okay, I'm not going to make any money. I don't make any money on anything, so certainly not business. I'm sort of anti-capitalist these days. So personal, well, it's really not about me, but I guess that's the closest thing. It's certainly a personal cause, so I'll check off personal. And then I, I go up to the customs agent, and she's, uh, oh, it's personal. Okay, well, are you bringing any gifts for the people that you're visiting? I'm like, ooh, busted. No, no, I guess it's not personal at all. And, you know, and then it's this whole thing and a strip search and all that stuff. And <laughs> it's weird how it all happens. So I updated the customs form to properly uh, show. <laughs> so hopefully that won't happen anymore. Uh, my talk's basically about four things. My son's recovery, uh, my recovery, which I'll put in quotations, uh, my four favorite therapies, and the understanding of how this disorder is related to ADHD and also uh, chronic illness. Um, this is the really start of everything that I have learned and, and mostly everything that I am is really about uh, my son, and I think a lot of us certainly feel that way. Um, uh, this is his, uh, he's, he's five and a half right now, but at, uh, at 20 months he was diagnosed with PDD. And uh, this is a little snippet from our developmental pediatrician uh, who, who writes that there may be some relationship between his difficulties, meaning Ethan's, and other members on his father's side. So right away, she's right on that. And certainly our relationship between she and I sort of is actually kind of reflected in that comment. Um, and then at three years old, after 750 hours of, of speech and occupational, physical and behavioral therapies, he was diagnosed still with autism at that time. All of those things he responded to, but he still received his autism diagnosis. Um, <laughs> uh, not that long ago, there was a, you know, and, and after you hear all that, that introduction, and you, you just feel really good that you're, 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 you're making a, a dent. And it wasn't that long ago when a doctor had said to me, he goes, you know, Stan, you're never going to be a real researcher, is what he said. This is just very recently. And uh, so this morning I was thinking about that, and I wrote something called Societal Autism. And I called it Behaviors that Perpetuate the Autism Condition, which are typically caused by a lack of understanding of the individualized value of every person. And... Uh, Symptoms include greed, ego, arrogance, selfishness, lack of self-realization to one's lack of knowledge, lack of intellectual honesty, and the lack of the inclusion of all thoughts which benefit children with autism and other disorders. And these symptoms of societal autism ultimately perpetuate the autism condition and impair the natural evolution, I think, of mankind. And I just want to say, uh, stop that. <laughs> Whew, you know, we've had enough. Um, I call myself a recovered adult with ADHD. I'm often reminded by my friends that that may not necessarily be the case, but certainly my IBS is gone. Um, uh, when I went to uh, Dr. Usler's to do a spec scan uh, on a woman with fibromyalgia, which I'll show you her results shortly, a mom, uh, there was some extra isotope and uh, Michael offered to, uh, for me to get a spec scan. And this was my spec scan. And the gray shows you how much is considered normal compared to 20 controls of my age. And the blue and all the shades of blue and green and the darker they get even into the black shows you areas of hypoperfusion, lack of blood flow compared to controls. Uh, certainly showing that as much as I've done, there is more to do. Um, and I would suspect that many of us have this and are probably scared to look, but the reality is, is the apple does not far, fall that far. Does anybody believe that? Or? <laughs> oh, not a lot of hands in the middle there. Okay, anyway, so I'm the owner of Children's Corner School. These are some pictures. The big thing that I'd like to talk about about the school real quick is the fact that every child there, whether neurodevelopmental, 
challenged in some way or another, or typical, whatever you want to define that as, all eat the same foods, which is a gluten casein free diet and also SCD included. And then I also pulled out foods that commonly set off the immune system. So we sort of made our own, what I call our caveman diet. And every child in our school is on it. Everybody eats green vegetables, all of them, ages two through six. I don't have one that doesn't. So it's extremely possible. I get parents all the time that go, my child will never. And that's usually our hellos. Um, we have a hyperbaric oxygen chamber at the school that was donated by uh, the International Hyperbaric Association generously. This is uh, my uncle Eli who had a stroke and his right eye was paralyzed and in four hyperbaric oxygen sessions his eye normalized. It was absolutely paralyzed in two sessions, was, was mobile but he was still had double vision at that point. Four weeks later did two more sessions. He actually got sick, he took the mercury containing flu shot in between, got a double pneumonia, we'll get to that, and, um, and then afterwards two more sessions and his eye was mobile again, really, and is, is completely normalized now, fantastic. This is our infrared sauna, which is uh, donated by High Tech Health, the folks that are right outside. If this is the single best investment I think you can make in yourself as a parent, because every parent of a child with autism we put in there feels so much better, more energy, more calm than, uh, than when, they, when they walked in. It's, it's, I think, a fantastic and certainly benign therapy. And the nice thing is you don't necessarily have to wear the Darth Vader outfit for it to work. <laughs> It's optional. Um, I'm a grant recipient from ARI, and I can't look at that picture or talk about it without getting a little upset. Um, uh, you know, I lost uh, my father last, last year and lost Bernie last year. It was a really tough year. And out of all the people that have, that have said things like my developmental pediatrician or that doctor that I was talking about, Bernie was the exact opposite. The first time I met him, he embraced me. And, uh, and he constantly supported, uh, you know, all the things you hear about Bernie are just absolutely true. So just from the get-go, constantly supported me, and I desperately miss him. This is Steve Edelson, the, uh, the new director of the Autism Research Institute, who carries that same torch and that wonderful attitude. Uh, this is pictures of folks in the damn think tank, and the, um, the one will never be a researcher guy is the one at the top in the middle there. All the other stuff was already in the introduction, so I'll let it go. Ethan's profile, he was uh, scheduled C-section. His APGARs were pretty good. Uh, he uh, had his uh, Hep B and vitamin K vaccine first day of life. And then the second day of life, very pale. He was actually pale on his first day of life. And, uh, and then he had jaundice. And uh, he needed platelets. Now, I didn't find out about this until recently when I went back and got the birthing records, literally a month or two ago. A friend of mine encouraged me to do it, went and, and checked the birthing records, and man, I found out that he needed platelets, and they never told us. Isn't that amazing? So I encourage everyone, go, go and, uh, and get the birthing records. You may find something there. Uh, he was always at the late to the end milestones during the first 12 months. Um, he originally did point and wave, had some words and sounds, and repeated wow at six months with great eye contact. And I have that on video. Um, he was, uh, you know, obviously clear, you know, you've seen pictures like this before. Well, this one, maybe not. It's a terrible picture, at least of me anyway. It's a great one of him. That's not a real tattoo. It's just on vacation. Horrible, looking chubby, oh, it's just terrible. But that was after the Austin Powers movie back then. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's a picture uh, with my dad when Ethan was uh, one year old. That was his one year old birthday. Um, sorry. That's uh, with his, uh, his sister, uh, his sister Jenna. And uh, this was actually the first sign looking back of something going on. Another additional sign, I should say, was this irregular hair growth that was going on. Uh, it was kind of a mohawk pattern. People thought we did that purposefully, you know, strangely looking at me going, oh, you know, you buzzed your kid, right? No, no, that's just the way it was. And uh, I've seen subsequently a lot of kids like this that come to the school with irregular hair growth patterns. Once you start them on the diet and get their gut cleaned up, a lot of those kids, and some of them, you know, are neurotypical, uh, their hair grows right back in just a couple weeks. It's just amazing. We have story after story like that. So gut relationship to autoimmunity, autoimmunity, and excretion, I believe, in the skin, and the excretion, whatever it's excreting, fungal toxins and the such, getting to the actual hair follicle, the immune system chasing it and killing it off. Why have I obsessed so much over this? I have absolutely no idea. 